Okay, thank you very much, Brooke, and um, uh, hello again to some of you. Um, <clears throat> uh, this talk will be repeating a little of what I said um, in my talk <coughs> yesterday, but I'll be um, using the information in a different way. Um, I'll also be touching on some of the um, ideas that were uh, uh, raised yesterday by Caroline Pudney. Uh, and just to emphasise uh, what I've got to say um, deals with um, uh, group identity <laughs> rather than individuals. Um, absent uh, contemporary literary or epigraphic evidence, um, we, and I can emphasise the we in the 21st century, can perhaps look at identity as <coughs> and our ideas on it as being constructed in three ways. F from the ways in which uh, we impose our categories on people in the past, from the evident and crude differences between material cultures of different people as it preserved for us 2,000 years later, and from the more subtle differences um, uh, in the ways in which uh, culture uh, was used, or at least the ways in which we think it was used. In all cases, uh, we're in greater danger than usual of projecting our own categories and views onto the subject of our studies. For instance, how far did Romano Britons um, recognise our categories of core, periphery and frontier? Did frontier people, especially soldiers, ever feel a shared sense of identity vis-à-vis -vis, uh, provincials, especially in the third century when provincial recruitment uh, may have become more common? And were the material differences uh, in culture between groups that seem obvious to us uh, thought of as being important at the time? Uh, what I've got to say today is not so much to try to provide answers, um, but to uh, hopefully um, just show how, uh, for the Chester area, how crude uh, the information is that we have at the moment, and hopefully uh, uh, suggest some uh, worthwhile uh, uh, routes of inquiry. Um, the prospectus for the session um, set out the categories of core, periphery, and frontier zone. Um, for the Roman Empire, uh, the categories that are have been uh, suggested in the past, um, originating, so far as I know, with Keith Hopkins, are um, Rome as political centre and the centre of consumption, um, an inner core of Mediterranean provinces, and the frontier. Anywhere between 33 and 75% of imperial taxation um, uh, was spent on the frontier garrisons, although some of this money may actually have gone to the inhabitants of, of the core provinces who supplied the frontier. Nor were military and political power confined to the capital. Uh, Tacitus observed of uh, Vespasian's proclamation as, Alex uh, as emperor at Alexandria, the truth was out, em emperors could be made elsewhere than at Rome. Just looking at Britain, uh, we can't see the m model of core periphery and frontier working at a provincial level. London may have been a political centre, but hardly seemed to have been a, uh, a core in any other sense. And again, the frontiers provided a counterweight. In AD 69, the governor Trebellius Maximus was expelled by the army, led by the commander of the 20th Legion, uh, Roscius Coelius. You see, we've always been troublemakers up here. Um, <laughs> and uh, in AD 306, uh, Constantine was proclaimed uh, uh, Augustus at York. Arguably until the middle of the 3rd century, much of the uh, agricultural production of the so-called periphery in Britain, the South and the Midlands, was orientated towards the garrisons of the North rather than to any single city. Finally, if we accept Whitaker's model of productively marginal frontier zones uh, seeing gradual development um, uh, to, to minimise um, reliance on more distant supplies, do they not... Uh, start to merge into, into the so-called periphery. It's inherently difficult to quantify levels of agricult ag agricultural production. However, it's quite clear that other forms of production in Cheshire, as elsewhere in the northwest, 
were inadequate to support the Roman military occupation. This is most obviously attested in pottery production. Thus, we see the establishment of um, pottery and uh, tile kilns at Holt under direct military control, other unlocated pottery kilns across the Cheshire Plain, and a more generalised independent manufacturing settlement at Wildersbourne, just south of Warrington. There's also large-scale salt production at Northwich, Middlewich and Nantwich. There seems to have been a greater increase in the number of rural settlements in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries in Cheshire than in some other parts of the country, followed by a decline in the 3rd century. And this surely ultimately <coughs> reflects the pattern of the military occupation. A priori, one would expect quite a lot of uh, veteran settlement in and around Chester. However, the area that one can currently conjecture for the Canabai, about 10 hectares, seems to be too small to accommodate veterans, their wives and families, possibly up to about 6,000 people. And unless they return to their hometowns elsewhere in Britain or on the continent, um, it seems that it would have lived um, in rural settlements surrounding uh, uh, the fortress. Thus, West Cheshire um, may have seen a continuation of the relatively, and I assume, uh, repeat, relatively egalitarian society traditionally posted <coughs> for the late, late pre-Roman Iron Age. And Kevin can take me apart on that one afterwards. Uh, supplemented by the settlement of veterans who may have been relatively well off, but not greatly so. So what do we know about the origins of the, uh, the people who lived uh, in Chester and hereabouts? Um, we only know the ge geographical origins of soldiers and veterans, and that uh, information comes from their tombstones. The only exceptions are altars set up by two Greek-speaking doctors. In the first and second centuries, a very large proportion of these soldiers came from the er early colonies in southern Gaul, the Dan <coughs> Spain, the Danube frontiers, and Thrace, as well as some from Italy. In, in the cases where distinctive names suggest a geographical origin, they con uh, conform to the same pattern. We don't know the origins of any of their wives and partners, uh, but it seems likely that they would have come from the same areas, uh, or were born in the Canabai. No other clear occupational roles are attested or implied inscriptions apart from slaves, uh, freed men and women, um, and of the slaves, four may have been Greek, including the two doctors. We only know the origin of two third century soldiers who died at Chester, a, th uh, a Thracian, um, a regular soldier, and a Prefectus Castorum from Osroene. Tombstones seem to be much fewer in the 3rd century than earlier. Um, and of these, 50% uh, record officers. Um, uh, this seems to be, reflect a general trend seen elsewhere in the empire, um, away from the assertion of military identity um, uh, in tombstones in favour of the advertisement of rank but it could also um, possibly uh, reflect the fact that more and more of the legion was made up by um, British recruits uh, who didn't share what's been called the epigraphic habit. For the rest, um, for the moment, we're dependent on distinctive styles of artefact to suggest the geographical origins of immigrants. The late Vivian Swan suggested the immediate origins of legionary wear made at Holt and elsewhere in Britain are to be sought in the Upper Rhine and Danube areas, and its manufacture may have arrived with troops uh, from those areas under Hadrian's. She made the same argument for some of the pottery made at Wildersport, but she didn't actually um, show any evidence for these specific troop movements. North African-style pottery was also made at Holt, possibly um, in the mid-2nd century, and that suggests the presence of people from that part of the empire. Uh, 
The chest of fortress gave physical expression to the Roman imperial political and social order. The, the grandeur of the uh, Legate's Palace. Have you got a, like, a pointer here? You, no? Ah, there we are. You may see it sticking up in, in the middle there. Um, in, in peel images in the eye days, um, at the back of the headquarters building, uh, the opus quadratum, uh, the large square blocks of the fortress wall, giving this um, impression of monumentality. Uh, the amphitheatre shown there in its third century form um, with its uh, executions um, and gladiatorial displays reinforcing uh, the Roman military ethos. Um, also, um, the classical religion and mythology depicted in the rock-cut shrine of Minerva um, and on funerary monuments, but also um, the social order is reflected in the cramped quarters of uh, the barracks inhabited by most of the soldiers, uh, slave shackles found in one of the barracks, and also this um, uh, little bronze figurine of a, um, a captive uh, found at the works depot at Holt. <coughs> Outside the fortress, roads and possibly centuriation uh, divided the landscape in a new way. There's a slide again I showed yesterday of uh, farmstead at Satan, just to the southeast of the fortress, and again here note the uh, rectangular division of the land. Um, it's, a, <coughs> it's, 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 it's only one jun road junction, but still rather suggestive. Uh, the roadside settlement at Heronbridge on Watling Street, about two, two kilometres south of the fortress, consisted of groups of strip buildings, um, possibly laid out on plots. They were laid out in, in plots, possibly one act of 120 uh, Roman feet square in, in groups of three. Uh, there was an altar there um, uh, dedicated to the Martres Olototai uh, by a man called Julius Secundus, um, who could easily have been an auxiliary veteran. But re reverting to uh, Satan, um, we have um, uh, both traditional uh, roundhouses and rectangular ones. Uh, do the, uh, con does the continued use of roundhouses um, reflect uh, deliberate resistance, unthinking conservatism, uh, or whether there are round, given there are round and rectangular buildings on the same site, was there a, a functional or symbolic difference, as you can see at Dean Sligwy on the east coast of Anglesey? Or, as has uh, been conjectured by the excavators, was there possibly um, a villa on the site, possibly under this uh, medieval moated site here, and were these other buildings um, used by um, a subject workforce? Despite the apparent conservatism in building form, pottery of the same types as were used by the military is found on rural sites in reasonable quantities, and seems to be more common in Cheshire than to the north in Lancashire or to the south in West Shropshire. However, very little metalwork and few coins are actually found on excavated sites, although they're not com uncommon as P uh, Port of Antiquities scheme finds, um, and uh, far more in Cheshire here than, for instance, around the Kivitas capital at Roxeter. On the other hand, almost 30 coins, uh, which is quite, quite a lot in regional terms, from the Republican period to the 4th century, have been found at um, Acton Bridge in the Weaver Valley. Um, where are we over this way here? Um, where there's also a small circular double ditch enclosure of traditional form. Um, uh, the association between the, the coins and the enclosure is a present unknown, but surely the one exists. And I think um, the uh, 
more detailed um, locational relationship would be worth investigating. The, co the core distribution of the so-called will-style brooch, which is um, uh, this type of brooch um, with uh, these rect rectangular panels of enamel, uh, uh, orange being especially um, favoured, it seems to be up uh, the Lower Dee Valley and along the North Wales coast. Um, but uh, they're actually conspicuously rare at Chester itself. It's been suggested um, in the uh, uh, Rural Settlement of Roman Britain volumes that they were associated with, um, pe uh, with people who were attached to the military in various ways as suppliers, traders and so on. And that they may have had different uh, views <coughs> on material culture from those occupying lower, states, low, lower status sites in the wider countryside. <coughs> I, I used to believe in this um, uh, dichotomy between um, what you might call uh, uh, immigrant rural uh, settlements and, and, and people um, and uh, native ones. Uh, but now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really not, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think if there was any sort of uh, what you might call cultural apartheid. I think it was uh, uh, very, very fine-grained. Uh, I don't think you had uh, lot, what you might call large-scale native reservations uh, where you, you went into a totally different cultural world. People are shaped by and in turn shape, in turn shape their geographical environment. So what geographical boundaries to their world and what connections uh, did the people who lived in and around Chester inherit and create? While the D estuary may have been convenient to mark a political boundary, at other times such boundaries have lain to one side of it or, or another, and in everyday life communications across it may have been quite frequent. And the D estuary seems to have been uh, frequented by Mediterranean people from the 5th century BC. Cheshire uh, very coarse pottery from the Weaver Valley uh, has been found across Cheshire, along the North Wales, the black, see the black dots there, along the North Wales coast, um, along the Severn, and also along the Wye. And also uh, on the Middle Trent here. Late pre-Roman Iron Age coins, so supposedly associated with the Dabunni of the southwest Midlands and the, uh, the Coriel Talvi, are occasionally found in Chester, in, <coughs> sorry, in Cheshire. And a hoard of such coins, along with Roman denarii of T Tiberius, found near Malpas, may attest the flight of Caratarchus after his defeat among the Ordoviques northeast to the Brigantes. While uh, Chester may have lain at the north e end of a corridor along the marches, um, it was nevertheless isolated uh, from the Severn Basin around Roxeter by the Ellesmere Moraine. And it had close links with North East Wales. And this division is um, uh, neatly exemplified by the intervisibility of Iron Age hill forts. So here's um, Ch uh, Ch Ch Chester's here. So you've got uh, intervisibility amongst between a lot of hill forts in this area, but very uh, few across to the, the Shropshire hill forts. So you are, although you've got uh, north-south communications, you've got two distinct basins, if you will. The basic distinction in the area, at least up to the start of the third century, <coughs> would have been between the invaders and their families and followers um, who all spoke a different language and the invaded. And this would have been reflected in legal distinction between citizen and non-citizen. Up to the end of the second century, soldiers, veterans and their families were also exempt from direct and many indirect taxes. And these people may have made up quite a large proportion of the people around the fortress. However, as we've seen, the military community itself would have been highly stratified and in fact would have been a microcosm 
of the whole of Roman society, from uh, senatorial class to slave. Under military oversight, veterans would presumably have run the Canabai and may even have managed the Prata Legionis. Manufacturing sites uh, such as those at Wilderspool and Nantwich may have been managed by, by negotiatores on leases from the procurator using slave labour. Theoretically, ma many distinctions disappeared when the Constitutio Antoniniana gave citizenship to all three inhabitants of the empire in AD 212. The military civili civilian distinction would have remained, but that may have become blurred if provincial or even local recruitment became more common. According to Ptolemy, Chester was a polis of the Cornovi, and there's been a lot of debate about whether this meant the Canabai became a town in the Greco-Roman sense. I think this uh, debate is misplaced. In Ptolemy, a polis means no more than a centre of government, and this assure, Chester would surely have been, although it was uh, a centre of military government. It's not clear that we can actually project a Cornovian territory of any sort back into the late pre-Roman Iron Age. Uh, perhaps the Cornovi are best just seen as the West Midland elite, um, uh, perhaps taking their name from the Rekin, um, and perhaps their territory only gelled as a result of uh, contact with Rome before the conquest, or even afterwards, just as um, a matter of um, Roman administrative convenience. In the first and second centuries, soldiers may have come from the different parts of the empire, but given that their homes tended to be Italian colonies, this need not indicate diversity. Um, uh, they could, in fact, have been uh, drawn from an endogamous elite whose social exclusivity was reinforced by the uh, legal privilege of Roman citizenship. Individual lifetimes, generations and memory rarely feature in Roman history, although we're used to seeing biographies of emperors and prosopographical studies of army officers. What I want to do is think about the experiences of people below this elite. For example, somebody old enough to have fought against the invasion of Claudius, if he was lucky, could have lived long enough to hear about the Battle of Mons Graupius and may have died believing that Britannia was indeed Perdomitor. He would all, um, uh, also have heard about the, for instance, the massacre of the Ordo Vices by Agricola in AD 77. This takes us back to the uh, extreme violence of um, the Roman conquest that Manuel was um, talking about a few minutes ago. It's interesting to speculate what tales these people might have told their descendants and how these might have fashioned <coughs> long-lived uh, social attitudes and identities. T to take a military example, the, the veteran Quintus Junius Licinius, who died aged 70, supposedly, in the later 2nd century, could <coughs> easily have taken part in the building of Hadrian's Wall. <coughs> and finally, how often uh, might soldiers have been redeployed uh, to other parts of the f frontier zone that they actually developed a sense of identity with the troops there. We talk about a frontier zone, but did the soldiers in different parts of that zone um, feel that they were actually part of a, a distinct um, grouping? The funnel-shaped de-estuary was Chester's gateway to the wider world. I've just mentioned its possible political role as a frontier marker, and in my previous talk, I also talked about its, its logistical role. However, uh, the river's Celtic name, Diva, the goddess, also suggests um, some sort of re uh, religious function. A number of burials have been found lining both banks of the river. Um, um, in the, uh, this area here, and also along here. The burial rites were conventional Roman ones, 
and the prominent location can easily be explained just as social ostentation, as with roadside burials. <coughs> but did the D also pro uh, provide an antitype for the Styx, which in classical mythology had to be crossed to reach the underworld? And as in Rome, the river may have provided a pr pragmatic way of dis <coughs> dis disposing of the remains of people killed in the amphitheatre. However, the idea of the dead crossing the river um, uh, to reach the underworld uh, was a very ancient and widespread one. So what tradition of belief did these rev uh, riverside burials at Chester reflect? Or do they actually reflect an underlying uh, commonality of beliefs uh, <laughs> amongst the native, between the native population and the immigrants um, that was one of the things that made uh, syncretism possible? So to wrap up, at least in the late 1st and 2nd centuries, West Cheshire was dominated by the presence of the Legion and its logistical needs. This was manifested in an immigrant population, often with superior legal and political rights, uh, with the establishment of new settlements and the reorganisation of parts of the countryside. If the picture of the countryside around Chester as being divided into small farms is correct, this would explain the absence of a conspicuous local civilian elite. Roman citizens may have thought of themselves as uh, Cives Romani, Romani consistent, Consistentes ad Legionem um, and looked to the officials of the Canabai and to military officers for leadership. Non-citizens further afield may have thought of themselves as Cornovii, but if so, what social structures um, bound them to the elite um, at the Kivitas capital, 40 miles away at Roxeter. What about the, the native population caught in the dense supply web that surrounded the fortress? They continued to live in traditional um, houses, in small settlements. They used Roman pottery, and I suspect they used uh, coins. What community, if any, did they feel themselves to be part of? So, where do we go from here? I think it'd be quite interesting, uh, even if it turns out to be a dry hole, to look at the epigraphy of the towns on the continent uh, uh, where soldiers of the 20th Legion were recruited to see if we can actually learn anything about uh, their, fa their families. Using the data assembled by Malone in his study of the Legion, we could also get a better impression of the degree of military mobility uh, among soldiers and thus of the way individual soldiers uh, may have seen their geographical connections. In other words, uh, if you were recruited into the Legion at such and such a time, uh, where might you have been posted to and how are you likely, how likely are you to have thought, oh yes, um, uh, I'm part of the same team as the guys uh, serving in uh, mid Wales or um, up on the northern frontier or wherever. Um, very few uh, rural sites around here have been excavated in their entirety and even fewer published. So our view of life in the countryside is still very crude and impressionistic. Portable antiquities schemes uh, scheme finds from the county have so far only been published as part of national studies or with a focus on particular categories, e.g. coin hoards. I think what we need is a study for the, uh, focusing on the county and its surroundings that takes into account associations between different types of objects and between objects and uh, nearby sites. And finally, and this is a ad shameless plug, um, which I forgot to make yesterday, so I'll make it now, uh, the wonderful reconstructions of Chester um, done by a local computer graphics artist, um, uh, Julian Ball. Um, he does it all in his um, spare time. Um, uh, he would like to do a much larger scale reconstruction of uh, Roman Chester in severe times, and uh, he would dearly love to have your money, and uh, <laughs> uh, you can support him via Patreon. Thank you very much indeed.